Last week we spoke about uh, forbearance and long-suffering and I want to continue on that theme a bit more because there's more for us to learn. And uh, I want to do so by beginning to read from a well-known parable from Luke chapter 18 and I want to read the first uh, five verses and it says there and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that man ought always to pray, and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man, and there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, Yet, because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now, what we see here is that um, the motivation of this judge to avenge the woman is not good. It's not good. Um, the result, of course, for the woman is good, but um, his motivation is not. Um, actually... He is he's unrighteous, uh, he's selfish, um, but he does it anyway in the end, he, he avenges her. It says uh, literally in verse uh, 6 that he is unjust, verse 6 and 7 read the following, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. So we read that the judge is unjudge, unjust, and that is actually sort of an oxymoron because the whole point of a judge is to speak justice. Uh, so an unjust judge is uh, is a strange thing to begin with, but uh, yeah, they exist uh, unfortunately. Uh, but so this judge is unjust, and it says he fears not God, nor does he regard man. He really doesn't care about. Um, God or about man. That's what it comes down to. He cares only about himself, actually. Um, and so what we often see when this parable is, is explained uh, is that, okay, we ought to be like the woman, continue to um, to pray. And basically, um, oh, that is correct. Um, and that's also the purpose of this parable, as it says in, in verse 1, eh? He spake the parable unto them to this end, for this purpose, namely, that man ought to always pray. This is what we take away from it, so so that's good. However, um, when we compare ourselves to the woman who prays, who prays always and continually, then um, you might want to compare the, the judge with uh, our Lord. And of course, there it, it doesn't go. Because, as said, this was an unjust judge. And so, that is not a comparison. That is actually a, a contradiction, a contrast, maybe I should say, rather say. Because if this unjust just judge, who cares not about God uh, or about man, if he would eventually listen to him, how much more our just judge, our Lord, who cares very much about man. And that is the contrast that is being made here. So it's really sh showing and emphasizing that our Lord will hear our prayers, um, but also that we should persist in them. Because he answers, but he answers in his time. Um, in verse 7, um, it says then, uh, what we just read, uh, about God, uh, shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him. And then it says, though he bear long with them, he bears long with his elect, with them, his elect, uh, the ones that pray to him. Um, so we also made this differentiation, I think, last week. God bears long with believers and he bears long with unbelievers with unbelievers that they may come to repentance and become believers, with believers that they uh, grow in him, but also that they repent from their sins, because um, as believers, unfortunately, we fall into sin also, um, yeah, ever so often, I would say. 
Um, so why does he bear long? Uh, like the unjust judge in this parable, it's not for selfish reason. Uh, the, the unjust judge, he, was, he didn't want to avenge her because he didn't want to bother, he didn't care. Uh, this is what he literally um, uh, says. Uh, I have uh, no regard for men. He doesn't care. So uh, he doesn't want to be bothered with it. It's pure selfish reason. And it's also selfish reason that he doesn't venture because he says, I get tired of her, all this this, uh, this pleading. Uh, so uh, let me just do it so that I get rid of her. It is pure selfish now with our Lord it's the opposite. He bears long with us for selfless reason. It it's really um, yeah, as we see in the word long suffering, he suffers as it were from our uh, behavior. Um, and but he is patient. He puts up with it um, for our sakes, for our sakes. So if we continue uh, here in Luke eighteen with the next verse, verse eight. There it says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. And this last part is often taken out of context and used in many different ways, sometimes good, sometimes not. But it's connected, of course, to the rest of the story here. What it says is that God will avenge his elect. He will it's a surety. And when it happens, not if, but when it happens, then it will happen speedily. It will happen speedily. Destruction comes suddenly. But until he does, he forbears. And that gives us, his elect in this context, the chance to repent and grow. Now many do not appreciate that grace. And instead of repenting and growing, they continue in their sins and they heap up judgment. And therefore, the question is asked right away here, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on earth? Do we answer to this forbearance by growing in him and growing uh, in, in character um, uh, to be more... Um, after his uh, his image, uh, or do we use this time to uh, to heap up more uh, judgment? Will I find faith? That is the question that Jesus asks. But something else happens during this period of forbearance, because there is an adversary of whom we are avenged eventually. That is both in the parable uh, of this woman. Eh? She asks the judge, avenge me of my adver adversary. And um, that is also what God uh, will do. God avenges his own elect against the adversary. Now, there are there is, of course, an ultimate adversary, the devil, Satan, uh, but we have many adversaries in in life that we um, that we we come that or that come against us, like the woman uh, has here in this parable. And um, there is another lesson here in this, um, maybe between the lines of this parable. Namely, are we happy uh, with uh, with what they get, with what they deserve? eventually are we happy to know well they may bother me now they may uh, persecute me now even but they will uh, they will get what they deserve i will be uh, avenged um, and so do we rest in that how do we see our adversaries and there is only two ways we can see them we can see them as um, our adversaries that need to be to be uh, judged and punished for what they are doing or we see them as lost souls that are in need of the savior Th these are the two options so do we fight them or do we reflect our faith on them and actually evangelize them 
and that might be through simply through behavior. If we think of our adversaries, do we ever think of them as um, our adversaries in this life? Do we ever think of them as brothers and sisters in Christ that may be worshiping uh, God next to us in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? Do we ever think like that? Are we forbearing them? Are we long-suffering for that reason? after the example of Christ. Remember what he said, turn the other cheek or pray for your enemies. And it's not without reason. So this period of forbearance is not only to make us grow and to test us, but it's also for our adversary, because they need also to repent. They need to come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And uh, God uses this time also for this purpose. And he may use us for this purpose. He, we are his ambassadors. We have this commission to evangelize. And the most difficult thing maybe to do is to evangelize uh, and to show grace to your adversaries. After all, they are bad to you. So it's very difficult to be good to them and to even um, present to them the greatest gift that there is to present. It's not easy, it's not easy, but neither is it easy for God to put, put up with us. And if it were not for the grace found in Christ, we would not stand a chance. Let's sum it up with a verse from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. We know it very well. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what we find there is this, uh, this word, us word. God is doing it for us, and not for him. It, it's, uh, it's suffering for God, in, in a sense. I've said this several times. That's why it's called long-suffering, or forbearance. He's bearing, he's putting up with us. He's doing it for us, not for himself, like the unjust judge did it for himself, but God is doing it for us. So this word, us word, is very, us word, is very important in this uh, verse. And the second thing we see is that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we have these words, any and all, which means it includes our adversaries. They are included in this. God does not want them to perish. And God wants them also to come to repentance. We should keep that in mind. And uh, also that that is uh, one of the reasons for, uh, for God's um, forbearance or slackness as it's uh, presented here. And we can take it a step further if we go a few verses down in 2 Peter 3 verse 15. Um, there it says, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. That God is long-suffering, that he is forbearing with us, means that we can have salvation. It says here, it is salvation, it's equal to salvation. If he would not be long-suffering with us, there would be no salvation. And remember that salvation in Hebrew is salvation from God is Yeshua, eh? Shua, salvation from God, from Yah, from Yahweh. So Yahoshua is the full word. God can be long suffering with us because of Jesus, and Jesus is the answer to God's long suffering. One does not go without the other. We could never ever please him on our own and if he would not be patient with us and work with us through Jesus none of us would make it into the kingdom of heaven now I touched already on our own forbearance as we should show that to our adversaries that again that's in between the lines of this this parable that we began with it's part, forbearance is part of God's character, as we have learned. 
and he wants us to learn to have it as well. And in fact, it's part of the fruit of the Spirit, as we can read in Galatians uh, verse, uh, uh, chapter 5, verse 22. Um, often there it's translated with patience, and of course patience is, is a synonym, but uh, yeah, as I also stated last, uh, last time, the word long-suffering um, carries more with it that it's hard. This patience is just waiting, basically. Um, but um, long-suffering and forbearance also, they carry with it that during this waiting, it, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's hard, actually, to wait. You are suffering, you're bearing, while you're being merciful and waiting. Um, so we are even specifically uh, instructed to forbear one another. And we can read about that in Colossians uh, 3, verse uh, 12 through 14. There it says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. In the last uh, sentence, uh, I have to, to also make a note. Uh, put, above all things, put on charity. Um, it should say there, or you should read there, love, not charity. Um, the word, the Greek word there is agape, and that this means love, uh, selfless love. Um, charity has a whole different um, um, uh, idea with it. Um, the Greek word would have been, if it was meant as charity, would have been philanthropia. Uh, but that's not what it says, it says agape, it's love. Philanthropia uh, is the Greek word the, that you would translate with charity. Charity itself, uh, by the way, is from the Latin, from the word karas. It's a Latin word, not Greek, which means benevol benevolence towards the poor. Um, so that's a whole different thing. Uh, and so that's, that's yeah, too bad that the word is there. Uh, it can give the wrong idea that you have to be good to the poor and um, uh, do well to your neighbors and that, uh, uh, that, that that would be the bond of perfectness. No, it's agape, it's selfless love that we speak about. We find the same, by the way, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, often called uh, the love chapter. Uh, it speaks all about love. The word that is repeatedly used there is agape. Uh, and it, unfortunately in the King James Bible it's called charity and again that gives uh, some people the wrong idea uh, about uh, what is being meant there. So in any case, what we just read here from Colossians, it speaks about uh, meekness, long-suffering and then it says forbearing one another. So, um, uh, and it continues, and forgiving one another. So, what we see here is that long suffering, forbearance is linked to forgiveness. And that makes sense. Um, yeah, we saw that earlier the purpose of forbearance is to allow the other uh, to change, to repent. So, um, therefore, we must also be able to forgive them, otherwise, it doesn't go. It has to come from two uh, from two sides. Um, and this is just as God does. Eh? It, it says also here, as even as Christ forgave you, we we um, we imitate Him in in these things. And uh, it says also, of course, in in First John one, eh? if we confess our sins, then He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He is just. Eh? He's not like this unjust judge, but he is just and he will also forgive. So this is the other thing. You can think of your adversaries, uh, okay, okay, I hope they will repent. And uh, But then uh, we keep this grudge in our heart oftentimes. Um, we are actually not really willing to forgive them for whatever they have done to us. And that is that's a problem. Then we should really seek the Lord to, um, to, to change that in us, to help us to get um, rid of this. 
um, Paul writes, even as Christ forgave you, also do ye. Now, I can take it another step further and state that the church, the body of Christ, can actually not exist without forbearance. Um, that's quite a statement, but we call it the body of Christ. And think of, of a body, of, of your own body. If something hurts or is wounded, you don't just chop off that part and go on without it. Um, you will give it time. Time to heal and time to become a full functioning part of your body again. Even though during this period of healing there may be lots of pain and inconvenience. You may have to endure this, but afterwards you will be happy that you went through this and that and whatever it may be is healed again. Uh, uh, sometimes you see people, um, or you may have experienced yourself, uh, they have broken a leg or an arm and it's in, uh, in a gasket and uh, uh, casket and, and they, or they have to use crutches uh, or uh, yeah you see there it's very inconvenient inconvenient for them um, uh, and it, it takes weeks months sometimes uh, before they can get rid of all that and uh, can can function normally but this is what you do you give it time you forbear you you suffer long eh? you uh, express long suffering so that there is time to heal and for things to be, uh, be right again. So forbearance is not just another virtue, but it's actually vital characteristics uh, of the members of the body, of the church. That is why Jesus says in Matthew 18, that if your brother offends you, you should forgive him. And not just once, but 70 times seven, which means basically as long as it takes as many times as it takes. And Paul gives the same instruction to the Ephesians. In Ephesians 4 and verse 2, it says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Here we have love. It's the same word, agape. So here it's uh, translated uh, more correct, I would say. Again, he's speaking to the members of the church, the church of the, uh, uh, Ephesus. And he too makes the point that the body of Christ cannot hold together without forbearance. And that comes out in the next verse, verse 3, and he, where he says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So forbearance and long-suffering produces unity. And he says, forbearing one another in love. Yeah? Our help. Forbearance and love and humility or meekness, they are all ingredients of the glue, you can say, that holds the body together. And they are all part of the fruit of the Spirit. So we can read that in Galatians 5. That's important because if you're indwelt with the Spirit, you should express these things. If you do not, if you have hatred towards your, uh, your enemies, and if you have uh, envy and... Uh, jealousy towards uh, your brothers and sisters, uh, then uh, something seriously wrong. And, and the Spirit of God is not uh, being expressed through your, uh, your behavior and uh, your thoughts. Now Satan knows that, uh, that all these characteristics are important to, to keep the unity of the body of Christ, of the church. And so what he will do, he will make people feel offended and uh, he will uh, stir up uh, slander and, and envy and all these negative things and um, make people feel impatient. And if you're impatient, you cannot forbear, obviously. You cannot be long-suffering. And so what will happen is that the glue will let go and the scattering begins. And that is typically what the false shepherd does. He scatters the sheep. Now what's already alluded here several times is that you cannot forbear without love, without this arapi. Um, 
again, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter is, says this, speaking about love, about agape, it says in verse 7, that it beareth all things. So again, here we have the word to bear, eh? that's the, the verb here. And uh, the word from which this, by the way, comes, um, this whole word, word forbearance in Greek uh, is stego. And stego uh, means um, to cover or to conceal or to protect. And it's a word that um, most people actually would know it. In, you might have heard from a dinosaur called the stegosaurus. And the stegosaurus is uh, known for these huge plates uh, on his body that are covering, um, covering shields, uh, in fact. And so that comes from this word, this to cover. And that's what's uh, part of the meaning. So when we forbear with a brother, with a brother in Christ in the church, um, that's like the body part that is hurting, that is maybe wounded. Um, but when we forbear with it, uh, with him or her, then we cover or conceal their sin or their fault. And we delay judgment. And all the while, why are we doing that? We're keeping the person's reputation intact. We're not gonna, gonna slander about it or whisper to others, uh, make it known, expose it. No, we cover it. And um, that gives the person time to repent and to get things right. And of course, if we would do otherwise and expose it right away and uh, destroy the person's reputation forever, uh, yeah, then he, even if he would repent, he cannot make it right anymore. Um, so that's, that's certainly not a thing to do. Ultimately, it might be necessary to expose evil um, or evil. It's not evil in this case. It's a brother who stumbles, basically. Uh, um, but if he persists in this, then of course we find this also in First Corinthians. Then, then you have to um, to uh, put him out uh, outside of the the body. But um, that's not what we speak about here. Uh, there is this selfless love. Uh, you you forbear with this person. And in First Peter, this is also written. It says love, again, arapi, not charity, love covers a multitude of sins and that is uh, absolutely so uh, and, and you see here the context of that it takes love to do that selfless love long suffering and the question is can we do that it is what God does to us now we do not only show forbearance toward brethren but also to the world so we, all the time we have these two things. We see the same that God does. He forbears with the world. He forbears also with his elect, as we just read. We, we are expected to do the same. Uh, Philippians 4 verse 5, it says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, moderation, again, it, it is forbearance. It's gentleness. So, and we should let it known to all men, it says. And uh, if you wonder why, why should we do this? Uh, well, it has been said anyway, but um, you would say, you could say, well, the time we live in, this generation, it's the most evil generation ever. Why would I put up with them? Why would I uh, forbear them? And the reason is given here in this verse. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. And so we have to think back of what we just read from 2 Peter 3, verse 9, uh, that uh, the main reason that God is long-suffering, that he's forbearing, is that none should perish and that all should come to repentance. And so here we read the same. We should make it known to all men. That's the reason. Because the Lord is at hand. All should come to repentance. And we are God's ambassadors. So we are, um, we are supposed to, to be like that, we should, to, to reflect this characteristic to all men. Now that does not mean that we agree in the sins of this evil generation, or even participate in them, God forbid. Sin is sin, and we should, ne we should never, um, or, or let me put it differently, we should very, be very clear about that, eh? that there's no, no doubt about that. But... 
the Lord is at hand. Judgment will come. And we may only hope and work towards that as few as possible people are judged for their deeds, but that as many as possible come to repentance and find salvation in Jesus. So we must endure for our own sakes and we must forbear for the sakes of others so that we may grow further and that others may repent and come to salvation. The Lord is at hand. Amen.